This is a special report of Commodities Risk Analysis, the 2010 COCO Squeeze. We discuss the squeeze or backwardation of prices that has occurred during 2010 in the life COCO futures market. The squeeze caused distress for many firms that rely on this market for routine business. We first describe the steps by which a few firms, as few as one hedge fund and one COCO dealer, organize the squeeze. To do this, we point out movements in prices, volume, and open interest, and we describe the probable balance sheet positions of these firms as they executed their strategy. Although successful so far, no squeeze guarantees profits for its organizers until they have successfully resold the commodity they bought up in great quantity. The second part of our report describes how the firms might resell their cocoa to retain some of the profits that today are in their balance sheets. Because this video describes a sequence of transactions that is sometimes complex, we have prepared a transcript. The transcript includes all of the slides that appear in the video. To obtain a free copy, send your name, company, city, and country to transcript at commoditiesrisk.com. These charts show the history of the July, September, and December 2010 life contracts in two ways. The red line in each upper chart traces the history of the July-September, September-December, and December-March spreads. The chart also shows the prices of the contracts in blue and gray. Each lower chart shows the prices in high-low close form, volume and open interest of the contract, and total volume and total open interest. These show how the July 2010 squeeze unfolded. We begin with events during late June. Total open interest rose quickly, culminating with a jump on June 30th of 24,000 lots to 196,000 lots. June 30th also saw an exchange for swap trade, EFS, of almost 24,000 lots. Such EFS volume is exceptional. EFS trades rarely exceed 100 lots and commonly don't happen. In spite of the jump in total open interest, July contract open interest did not change. Here is the September contract. Total volume and open interest are the same as on the previous slide. The price, the contract volume, and contract open interest have changed to show the September contract. On June 30th, the September contract volume and open interest jumped by about the same 24,000 lots. Volume and open interest in more distant contracts did not change. All the increase occurred in the September contract. Here is a picture that shows what probably happened. It assumes that one hedge fund and one cocoa dealer are executing the squeeze, and it places their balance sheets side by side. It also assumes that the dealer is acting as the advisor to the fund. This arrangement coincides with news reports and the assessments of many observers. Besides sponsoring and advising the fund, the dealer will manage the cocoa for the fund when ownership is acquired at expiration of the July contract. This makes the dealer the stopper, that is, the entity that receives the cocoa that other firms will deliver when July expires. They would rather turn over cocoa than pay the high price of buying back hedges that they placed months ago using the July contract. Executing the squeeze probably happened this way. Sometime before June 30th, the fund purchased 24,000 July contracts. The average price of its purchase probably was 20 to 70 British pounds per ton. In a moment, we'll discuss how we reached that number. It may have purchased and resold a few thousand more. To acquire some of its contracts, the fund probably bought July calls. We will point out the role of options from time to time. The dealer may have been buying and selling for its own account. We have not counted the dealer's trading. We also have not described the flow of margin monies between the fund, the dealer, and the life. On June 30th, the fund transferred to the dealer all its Cocoa Futures contracts, 24,000 lots of July 2010. In return, for 24,000 lots of September 2010 futures, and in return for a swap and other agreements that we will list in a moment. The dealer took the short side and the fund took the long side of the September contracts. This created the jump in open interest of the September contract. The agreements between the two parties likely included the following. The swap covered price changes in the July-September spread from June 30th until the July contract expired on July 15th. 
It provided that if July's price rose relative to that of September, the dealer would pay the difference to the fund, and if July fell relative to September, the fund would pay the difference to the dealer. A management agreement in which the fund promised to reimburse the dealer for the costs of warehousing, insurance for storing the cocoa, and for interest on the loan of about 650 million pounds needed to pay for the beans at July expiration. A profit sharing agreement for dividing the profits and losses after reselling the cocoa sometime in the future. How much profit did the fund and dealer hold in their respective accounts when business closed on June 30th? We estimate that the fund held about 56 million pounds. It may have held a few million more if it initially bought more than the 24,000 lots and resold some before the 30th. Profits of the dealer came from management fees and from trading for its own account. These do not appear in the balance sheets. Through the swap, the fund and dealer each faced the same risks from further price changes as they faced before June 30th. If the fund used call options on the July 2010 futures contract to acquire its long position, the cost of these options could have substantially reduced its profits. It may have reduced this cost by selling puts. The costs of such strategies usually are so large that options on July probably played a secondary role at most. During this period, the fund probably also bought puts on the September 2010 and more distant contracts to hedge the cocoa that it expected to receive in July. The average purchase price of the fund's July contracts was probably £2,270. We estimated this by noticing details from the history of July volume and open interest. First, open interest rose more quickly after the beginning of April. The difference also is notable when we compare the July 2010 contract with the July 2009 contract. This slide places the July 2009 contract on a chart that matches it to July 2010. For example, the chart shows on any day, such as April 1, 2010, the price, volume, and open interest of the July 2010 contract and the price, volume, and open interest of the July 2009 contract on April 1, 2009. One can use the chart to compare contracts from different years. In about six weeks after the 1st of April, open interest in the July 2010 contract catches up with the open interest in July 2009. Volume in the 2010 contract also increases during the same period. This chart accumulates the difference in volumes between the July 2010 and July 2009 contracts. If volumes during 2010 had repeated those of 2009, the line would stay at zero. A rising line means that the July 2010 volume is greater than was the volume of trading in the July 2009 contract one year earlier. By the start of May 2010, trading volume in the July 2010 contract accumulated to 20,000 lots more than had occurred in the July 2009 contract. Then it jumped to 50,000 lots, then declined, then stabilized at 20 to 25,000 lots more than during 2009. Open interest and volume indicate that trading was more active during 2010 in about the same amount as the transaction on 30 June. Some of the extra volume during early May might have occurred because the fund bought and soon resold some amount and because other traders were buying and selling more actively than in 2009. The average closing price of the July 2010 contract from April 1st to May 15th was £2,273. We have rounded this to £2,270. For this purchase price, the fund booked a profit of £56 million on June 30th. If it began buying earlier than April, or if it bought more than 24,000 lots, its profit probably was larger. Trading may have increased this profit, while extensive use of call options probably would have reduced it. During the period from June 30th to when the July contract expired on the 15th, the fund's assets increased because the July-September spread increased by £210. As the spread rose, the dealer paid to the fund another £50 million. When the contract expired on July 15th, the fund had cash of about £106 million. On July 15th, the dealer took delivery of 240,100 tons of cocoa, probably using a bank loan of 650 million pounds. When the July contract expired, July open interest and total open interest each fell by
by about 24,000 lots. The repeating transactions involving 24,000 lots suggest very strongly that the squeeze involves only one fund and one dealer, and that the 240,100 tons of cocoa must be resold or stored in some way. Between June 30th and July 15th, smaller changes occurred in July and September open interest. These probably did not directly affect the fund's position, and we have excluded them from our report. What happens next? The fund, through the dealer, owns 240,000 tons of cocoa. On the other hand, it has no factories with which to process the cocoa. Folklore of the cocoa market tells that a legendary cocoa buyer quipped. There are three parts to every squeeze. The first is getting in. The second and third are getting out. How might the fund and dealer unwind their position without losing the profit they have accumulated? Please join us for the second part of this special report from Commodities Risk Analysis, the 2010 Cocoa Squeeze. There we will discuss how the fund and the dealer may try to unwind their position.